In the last video, we learned about some cloud native concepts and I mentioned that they're very important to understand. And even if you, if you kind of skip them in your infra, if you don't uh, apply those principles in your uh, or, or those concepts in your infra, that's okay, that's good to go. Uh, you won't have a lot of problems. But in this video, we'll talk about some cloud native tenets, which are um, kind of like a checklist. I mean, nothing terrible will happen if you don't follow these, but if you follow these, that will lead to a very stable and solid architecture. And those are basically best practices if you if you go through this checklist, right? So um, you can either do the bare minimum, right? And have a very unstable infra, but what I'm showing here, the, the checklist is like a best practice and uh, it's, it's you know, the, the, the really good things that you can do to make your infra really stable, all right? Uh, let's let's zoom in and let's start with the first one. So if you have your applications as stateless, so if your cloud native, native applications are stateless, meaning that they don't store session of the client, that will make them extremely stable, very scalable. So all the topics that we'll cover here are about stability, scalability, resilience, uh, you know, uh, reducing failures, all basically all of those things. These are the good, the best practices, all right? So have them, have your applications as stateless. Uh, you'd want to have distributed computation. You don't want to rely on just a few, uh, let's say, you don't want to have completely centralized control. If you're using messaging, use distributed messaging in the sense multiple uh, instances. If you're using databases, try and use databases like Cassandra, which are completely distributed databases, and so on. Right. So this distributed basically means that you can link together multiple computers over the internet. And also you can distribute your tasks and your uh, load between multiple computers so that even if one system goes down, all the others can still keep functioning and you have high availability. So distributed computing leads to high availability, high stability, high resilience, because you can very easily bring your system back online. The next one is non-local storage, which basically means that you'd want to store your data on cloud spanning multiple locations and not just on on premise or on uh, SDDs, right? Obviously, if you have your data across has, and this data is replicated across multiple locations, you would have higher availability and very easy, uh, you'll be able to restore everything very easily. Okay, so your system will be robust. So that's what non-local storage does. Then you'd want to have redundant network connections. So what I've mentioned here is that duplicated infra where additional or alternate instances of network devices and connections are installed to ensure an alternate path. So what's happening here is that um, you want to have multiple different replications, you want to have multiple different connections, so that if one side of the system fails, all the others are still online. So you want to have duplicated infra, okay? Uh, duplicated infrastructure is not necessarily the same thing as distributed computation. So we talked about distributed computation. Distributed computation, Basically, there are multiple nodes or clusters. All of them are uh, talking to each other. That there are multiple, um, there are, you know, um, consensus consensus uh, mechanisms for them to concede on which of the nodes should become the master node, and so on. But duplicate infrastructure basically means that even if it's not distributed, it can still be duplicated. Like you have a separate infra for India, separate infra for US, separate infra for for UK, so that Indian users uh, are able to. Uh, they don't have to make requests to the US infra, they, they have their own infra in, in, the, in India itself. So that's written in network connections. Then you, you'll, you'd want to have extensive as well as uh, exhaustive monitoring. So that means that you have monitoring at multiple levels, which is uh, at the application level, which could be front end and back end, at the database level, at the complete infra level. And you'd want to have it for all conditions. So all conditions makes it exhaustive, and this make, makes it extensive at, at, at every single level. All right. Now, uh, you'd want to have immutable deployments. This is, again, a really good best, best practice that you'd want to have, and you'd want to b bring your DevOps team on uh, on the same page. This basically means that uh, if you're deploying something new, you'd want to have it deployed to a new set of set of servers so that the old set of servers can be taken down, uh, you know, and everything on this new server can be brought back, uh, brought up. And there's like a um, there's a there's a time when both of these are at the same time. There's an overlap. Both of these are online at the same time. So this just makes deployments very very stable. So um, so this is what it says it says launch a full set of new instances running the new version of the application in a separate auto scaling group alongside the instances running the old version. Right. So there's an overlap on as to when both of these are online at the same time. And then you slowly want to 
remove the old version when you know that the new version is stable and then everything is working on the new version. This is uh, the right way to do things. Then you have your self-healing infra. So self-healing infra is a very common term these days. And this is used to uh, indicate that even if your servers, they detect some malfunction, they're able to uh, repair those malfunctions. So like you can have scripts where it says that if this uh, error is, is detected, you can bring back the server up, up again. And so this kind of automates uh, your work and you don't have to have any external in in intervention to bring back the server or the infra back online. Then you have uh, the fact that any anti-pattern while deploying, so you, you'd want to have Im immutable deployments, right? So if there's any anti-pattern happening, anti-pattern basically are things that uh, are not supposed to happen, right? So there are patterns which are the best way to do things and then there are anti-patterns which are the wrong way to do it, something. So any deployment anti-pattern you need you want to be uh, want it to be automatically detected and you want it to be automatically reported okay and then it's i've mentioned it's very similar to the above point this one but they they have their differences they are similar uh, but they have their differences this happens only during deployment but this happens during when the infrastructure actually fails or some parts of the infra fail and uh, you need some automation to bring it back online then you want to have uh, this is like uh, this is a no-brainer. You you want to have out of out of all the things that you could have like robustness and resilience and blah 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 blah, you at least want to have scalability and elasticity as a, as a best practice. So, I've I've here I've mentioned the difference between scalable and elastic. So scalable systems basically, uh, you know, don't necessarily mean that they'll scale up and down. It's only about being able to reach peak loads. So if you have five million users, so does your system scale up to that to that level? Whereas elasticity is you know, uh, your system is able to recognize the dynamic needs up and down and, and is able to scale up and scale down and, you know, reduce and uh, expand based on that. So um, I've said here, even if that means reducing capacity. All right, so that's the difference between elasticity and scalability. And these were your cloud native tenants. So the more uh, you're able to hit off in as a checklist, your system becomes more uh, stable. Uh, and these are kind of important to, these are like best practices, so it's, these are kind of important to uh, maintain your system, right? whereas the other ones were just concepts that you need to understand, even if you don't uh, apply some of these, uh, or consider some of these like vendor lock-in and all of these things, and it's okay. But these reactive properties you would want to uh, consider in cloud native concepts, but again, like I said, these are um, optional, like not necessarily all of your cloud apps need to be message driven, right? All right, so this was, um, the cloud native tenants and from next video onwards we'll start talking about the uh, different types of architectures you could use in your cloud applications. I hope you're enjoying the series. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.